<clears throat> Open your Bibles to Psalm 23. Verse 3. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Restoreth in the Hebrew just means bringing something back. He's bringing what we lost when Adam sinned. A connection back to him. Now we live in a time where Jesus already came. You know all the promises that were fulfilled by His coming and the hope we have in Him. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. Christ has done that for us. For His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day of my life. And I will dwell in the house of of the Lord forever. Or to the length of days. In some translation. I like the translation forever better here. I'm not going to get to all these verses. It's probably a two part message. But let's start by going back to verse 3. David is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Something leaps out at me when I read this verse. Now while he's in this valley, this valley of the shadow of death, he's clearly saying here that this was a continuation of his walk in the path of righteousness. It is here where he says, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though these paths of, path of righteousness, even though being right with God from a New Testament standpoint through Jesus Christ, I'm still in this valley of the shadow of death. But, or nevertheless, you are my shepherd. And you are there with me in this valley. Now, a lot of Christians think when something goes wrong, God has abandoned them. Or, if something goes wrong because they're not a good enough Christian, whatever that means. Or if something goes wrong, God's punishing me. God does allow some of the ramifications from our stupidity of most of the problems that we create that He had no hand in. But He'll use those situations as a teaching moment, as they would say now, for a purpose. And the biggest purpose is to start trusting in Him again. Stop trying to take control and let Him lead the way. So don't think as a Christian that, oh my gosh, God is mad at me. He doesn't want any part of me because I'm in this valley. 
If that's true, then might as well throw these verses out the door. Because it clearly says here that David here, I'm not getting, getting into whether this is a Masonic Psalm or not, but I just want you to personalize this this evening. David here is acknowledging that he's in the path of righteousness when he was writing this psalm. And God has him there for his name's sake, even though I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know about you, but death is pretty sad place to be. I know we have our hope after death and where we're going to be. But when usually people think about the valley of shadow of death, they're thinking about some horrible circumstances that bring you to that point where you're going to die. David wrote this while he was walking through a valley of shadow of death. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, even though these paths of righteousness takes him and us through these valley of the shadow of death. When God, God enters in, He being our shepherd, the one thing when you read this psalm through is the guarantee that He will also be there in that valley. Well, I never thought in a million years that being a disciple of Jesus Christ, or just being a follower of Jesus Christ, someone that's now on the path of righteousness because God is, I mean, Jesus has bridged that gap where now God sees me as righteous because He doesn't see my sin any longer because it's been removed. Why would I be in such a valley? And I never expected that being a faithful disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ and being righteous with God on that path would take me through such a horrible valley. And not just any kind of valley, a valley of shadow of death. I'm here tonight to tell you. I'm here tonight to tell myself. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to have to walk through some of those valleys. And probably many times in your lifetime. And you know what? Whether you want to realize it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, whether I want to accept it or not, those valleys are central to our calling. Well, what are you talking about? You don't go there because I'm going to go back to... Well, you can go there if you want, if you're fast enough. Because I'm going to go right back to where it's Psalm 23. But if you go to Second Peter, you write this down if you don't want to go to it. Second Peter, verse 22. No, let's do 21. No, not 2 Peter, 1 Peter, excuse me. I got my Peters confused there. It's 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. What do you mean it's part of our calling? These valleys. This is just one of many places. But here in... 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, or for you, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Remember I told you, taking up your cross, denying yourself, taking your cross and following Jesus, taking up crosses. The cross bearing you do for following Jesus Christ. Being His disciple. Things that you're involved in and do for the cause of Christ. It's not necessarily your own personal burdens. 
There's plenty of other scriptures, as I said before, that covers that. This is the things that is related to, to the cause of Christ. And it says, also suffered for you, leaving us an example that ye should follow in the steps. Why? Because if you're not a dud for Jesus, you're going to get the attention of Satan and his minions. He doesn't like you part of that program. And he, they're going to do their best to knock you off your feet and keep you there. It's part of the journey, my friend. It's our calling. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you want to be right with God, Because your path now is laid out in righteousness because what Christ has done for you, you better expect the kind of cross for the cause of Christ that will come. Well, this is not a very positive message. Oh, yes, it is. For those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. I think... Once you come to that knowledge, not just a learned knowledge, but a knowledge that your heart and mind is now in agreement with what the Word says, it really is something that sets you free. Because it now puts you in a place that you are prepared for your journey to our destination, your destination. And what is the final destination? Well, it says here in the scriptures, back to Psalm 23, verse 26. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Highlight this. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No matter if you want to take the more here and now translation or more of an eternal translation, the forever part or the to length of days part, it's still our destination. To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because the house of the Lord is our inheritance. What lies ahead is what's promised by God for us because what Jesus Christ provided and that is the opportunity to attain all the things that comes would be at that destination that's promised and then some so what are you saying I'm saying the path of righteousness, being right with God, through and by Jesus Christ, will lead you to the house of the Lord if you stay on that journey. <coughs> Listen, I don't like problems. I don't like circumstances that squeeze me. I don't like illnesses. I hate all those things. And occasionally I find myself griping. But as I get older in the faith, I quit griping a little sooner than later because I've come to understand that I need to run to the Word. I need to run to God's Word that lays it out clearly that I shouldn't be surprised of what I'm facing. I repeat, it's part of our calling. So either we could keep griping about it complaining about it or start walking through that valley. This is from David, my friend. Now, just to be clear so no one confuses what I say, that path of righteousness that we read in verse 3 doesn't come by any of your works. It's by faith in Jesus Christ and what He's provided. Just thought I'd throw that out there because there'll be somebody 
Now come along and just hear this message and say that I'm preaching a message of works. No, I'm not. Let me describe a little bit about a valley. Those of you ever taken any geography or ge ge geog geology classes know that a valley is, well, you don't even need to take those classes to know this, is a low place and sometimes a very low place in a physical sense. Why? Because it's a place that's surrounded by mountains. It seems like valleys and mountains go together. And when you have a valley, that's something that makes it a valley, is mountains. Now because that valley is surrounded by mountains, you cannot see on the other side of the mountain, no matter which way you look. Look to the right, left, you can't see it because there's a mountain there. You look to the right, there's another mountain there. So, at valley level, unless you have x-ray visions that could pierce right through that mountain, you're not going to see what's on the other side of that mountain. So what usually happens? You focus on what you can see. Not what you can't see. That's human nature. And the reason is because you can see what's in the valley. <clears throat> I think what David is describing here, at least one of the characteristics of his spiritual valley that he was facing was the valley of the shadow of death, a low place, a place that brought him to humility, really. And when you're walking through it, if you're still walking through that valley, you really can't see where you're gonna, your final destination is or where you're going to end up. The mountains make it physically impossible. They're too high, too deep, they're all around us, and it makes it impossible to see our destination. And there lies the temptation. As I said, as you're walking, if you're still walking through the valley, your focus changes. Your focus starts focusing only in on what's in that valley. It's not focusing on the journey through the valley and where the valley is taking you. It's just focusing on where you're at in that section or part of that valley. And this usually leads to depression, despair, discouragement, grief, the list could go on and on. This is a picture of our trials. It's a picture of our problems. And when we have these problems, whatever their problem is, whatever trial you might be going through, your perception becomes localized. Why? Because you can't see what's on the other side of that trial. What's the other side of that problem? Oh, you may imagine it if all things were just perfect in your life, the way you wanted it to be. But most of the time it's just a pipe dream. It's wishful thinking. So you start focusing on where you're at in that trial and you start focusing on sometimes trying to figure out only by your strength and power and your abilities too many of us are too smart for our own good think that we can outthink God 
and come up with a better solution than he can and there lies the problem we put our trust in the wrong person and I know I felt it many times you're surrounded by all these imposing mountains you can't see where you're going and you don't even know why you're going in the first place so it develops as an attitude where everything contradicts against the faithfulness of God when you find yourself in that kind of situation it produces a kitchen, a, not kitchen, <laughs> a condition where everything seems to be overwhelming. Listen, I'm preaching to myself first. If any of you can identify out there with something that I'm saying tonight, then grab onto it. When we are in this kind of valley, a valley of suffering, I just call it that, sometimes the only thing you can focus on and think about is the pain and the uncertainty that the valley brings. The first thing and the only thing you think about is, I want this to end. And your goal, you almost come obsessed with your goal that you want to get out of this valley and you want it to end. And if you could have it your way, even though you can't see the end of the road or the end of the valley, you wish you could transport yourself all the way to the end of that valley, no matter how long the distance, how long the path to the end of the journey is, you wish you just could be at that place so that everything that brings you down, causes you to suffer, brings you pain, can end. But that's usually not what God designs in our life. It's not the path or the journey that He takes us. And David made it very clear, and David was no saint. He was a man that seek God and pursue God, but he had his flaws. He became a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, because he trusts God. Many different occasions in his life, even with his flaws and sin. He knew what he could run to, lean on, and who could put him back on the path of righteousness. That was David's God. I never, and it took me a long time to accept this also. I wanted always God to take me from this point to the end point. Like the Flash. You ever see that cartoon character that became a TV series? A man that immediately could go from zero to I don't know how many hundred miles per hour and get to point A to point B in a flash? That's why it was called the Flash. That's how I like my trials to be. That's how I like my valleys to be. I get through them in a flash. That's not what God designs though. Why? Because it's clear what it says in the scriptures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, I walk through the shadow of the valley of death. God, I'm convinced, will keep us in that valley as long as he deems necessary but 
He also wants us to walk through that valley. When we do finally emerge from that valley and we arrive at our destination or purpose for the reason why we're in that valley, He allowed us to stay in that valley. That once that valley is through, in a nutshell, because our focus is now on Him and how He leads us, because we put our trust in Him through the valley, we now become someone that's in harmony with God. Most Christians running loose, and no exceptions, are not always in harmony with God. Now, I mentioned it earlier in this message that we cannot see sometimes in this valley where our final or destination for the reasons why we're in this valley in the first place. We can only see the valley. And as far as the valley of the lifetime of valleys, we definitely can't see the end of our valley in the final destination. But the solution to all that, of course, is probably never to try to see what we cannot see. Let that sink in. What I'm trying to say is, we wasting our time, we try to see over the mountains. And the reason is because we can't. And by my own personal experience, we cannot understand everything about that valley. And sometimes it's not even given to us to understand. Till after the valley is behind us. I think it's a very normal part of life. What we experience in the valley for a disciple of Jesus Christ. But, the one thing we do understand while we're in this valley, and David made it very clear is, in the next verse, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Highlight those words. I will fear, fear no evil. Why? Because, what does it say? For thou art with me. I won't even have a chance to get into the next part of the, ver the section of that verse until next time when I preach on this. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So, even though I can't see where I'm going, what David's saying here, I can trust the one that's leading me. Sometimes we're not able to see God. And I'm talking about through His Word. Because our brain is all mixed up. Because what the valley does for us. Let's just call it that. But one thing is for sure. Keep believing that God sees you. Keep trusting that God sees you. And is with you. Like I said, David was not perfect. But he kept trusting God in his valleys. Write down this truth. I have it written down in my Bible. God is just as much with me. when I can see Him, as He is when I can see Him. You can even say that about understanding. God is just as much with me if I can't understand Him. As when I think I can understand Him. 
my perception of what God is, is not the measuring stick for his faithfulness. He is with me, he is with you, regardless of our perception of him on the path of righteousness, provided once again by Jesus Christ. Because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he's already done for us. If you are a true believer in what his blood did for you and the reasons why he did it to bring you back to the path and the place where you are right with God, our perception will shift. And just in case you slip and forget that for a moment, what David's saying here, he hasn't forgotten about us in that trial. He's not just going to let you slip away. Unless you completely deny his only begotten son, He is there with you. And David goes on to say, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. It's a silly, it's really not silly. It's a really a simple statement of faith that's presented here in this verse. It's almost like a parent-child relationship. You ever see a little child that's in a crowd with his parents and they get kind of fearful and scared so they hide behind their and cling on to their parents leg that's what David is saying here thou art with me for that reason as a child placing their trust in their parent for protection and guidance so do we have that opportunity to have that same protection and guidance that God provides. So therefore, whatever comes our path, in our path, we don't have to fear it. Because why? We fear no evil. And the only way you can fear no evil if you believe that God is with you. Now that's not easily obtained. I must admit. But it doesn't change the biblical principle how we should respond when evil or evil tidings presents its ugly head. David's saying here, and I repeat, I will fear no evil in the valley. Why is he saying that? Because he knew that God was with him. I'm running out of time. I think I'll conclude with this. When all is said and done, all your problems, all your trials, all your tribulations, of faith boiled down to one choice. Do I believe God is faithful? That's it. This is not a hard message to understand. It's really a simple message. It's a basic mes message 
that delivers it all down to this one question up to this point. Do I believe God is faithful? What are you facing tonight? What valley are you in? Do you believe God is faithful? Do you believe that God is with you? Or, yeah, I guess the other question you could ask, or you don't. I believe, and some of you need to plaster this on a large piece of paper or on your wall, on your computer, do wherever you have to remind yourself when you're in these valleys and these trials. Make yourself face that question. And when you're in these valleys, come back to that question over and over and over. Why? Why is it important to face that type of question? Because I believe it cuts through the root of the problem, it cuts through the root of the matter, and it'll probably help you clear up some confusion. And it'll bring things into the light. Because if you do trust and believe that God is with you, I believe you'll start acting like it. You probably start seeing how foolish. I'm speaking from experience. It would be to keep saying that I believe God is with me and then continuing acting as if God isn't with me. Apply it to yourself. I think God almost forces us to that question in the valleys. God saying, do you believe that I'm faithful? In the valley that you're in? No matter how awful that valley is, and how you perceive it, do you believe I'm faithful? No matter how many fears, emotions, lack of understanding, that you might find yourself entertaining the thought that brings you to the point to denial that God is with you. And people do get there with that type of thinking. Cut it out. If you're a Christian, then you need to start acting like one. Do you believe God is faithful? Do you believe God is with you? And if you do, then you're going to have to put everything aside that treats as lies anything that says otherwise. If they start treating as lies anything that says otherwise. Sometimes they seem really real too. They're lies, my friend. Well, this looks like I'm taking a step in the dark because you don't know my situation that I'm in. 
Yeah, even David thought that. Because he labeled it the valley of the shadow of death. But take the steps anyway. You're walking, you're taking steps through that darkness. And let me tell you right now, and write down these words, if you are a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to take many steps in the dark. And I know that's opposite what most Goonie Christianity teaches. But I'm reading heroes of faith that experience just that. So who were, whose words are you going to believe? Heroes of faith, a hero of faith that was a man after God's own heart, or Goonie Christianity, in all their super spiritualism nonsense bullspit. Now, I understand that a Shadow can be cast over your understanding. I understand that a shadow can be cast over your ability to function correctly from an emotional standpoint. I understand all that. But besides all that, you can be certain of God. When you take that step by faith into what you perceive as the darkness, at least the darkness that you perceive because of the flesh and natural life, is always a step into the light. From God's perspective. Sometimes we have to refuse to trust our own understanding. And whether you understand it or not, always choose to trust God. And that requires relinqu relinquishing control of your life. An unconditional surrender to God. And when you arrive at that point in the valley, you feel a certain type of freedom that you never felt before in your relationship, I believe, with Jesus and God the Father. One of the biggest lies that's peddled out there among the Christian world is this notion that if we understand how God is faithful, maybe we'd be, we wouldn't be in a position where we find ourselves in a place where it's more difficult to trust Him. That's a mirage, my friend. God's faithfulness is never dependent upon whether we understand Him or not. His faithfulness is completely independent of our understanding. I don't have time to go to it, but in Proverbs it says, Lean not unto your own understanding. In wrapping up this message, looking at these verses, God kind of shoves us to the point of choice. Where you are going to ask the question, which kind of adds on to the question I told you to ask earlier when you find yourselves in valleys. It says, Thou art with me, or will you say just the opposite? 
I don't believe you are with me. Obviously, the former is the choice that he wants you to make. And that is, thou art with me. And I believe, when you get to that point where it says, thou art with me in this verse, he will say to us, through his word and spirit, if you believe I am with you, with me, then take the next step on the path of righteousness. That's where we began, through this valley. What he's saying, don't slip your focus away from what Christ has already provided you. A path that you could be right with me. Why? Because you had to trust in what my son did. You think he's going to leave you in the valley? You might there be there for weeks. You might be there for months. You might there be there for years. But if you are, He will be there with you. You're not going to be there alone. That's the promise. And as you take the next step forward, you will find the power and strength to keep going. But that won't happen if you turn back. That won't happen if you take another path. And that also won't happen if you stand still and you have an attitude where you refuse to move. So as I finish this part one of this message, we have to say to ourselves, when we find ourselves in the valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because He's here with us. And you're willing to put your trust and risk everything on His faithfulness. Now there's thy rod and thy staff part. But that will be next time. When we look at these verses from the valley viewpoint as I continue this. You got it? Play a song I want to hear from you. <laughs>